And we are still in the first 12 verses. We're calling it God's wisdom for daily living. Because in these 12 verses, Solomon gives us some couplets. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. It's been a while since we've read the entire passage. Let's do that. If you'll follow along with me, I'm reading from the NIV. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. That was principle number one. Remember God's commandments and do them. That word keep means obey. Verse 3, let love, the word is kindness, and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. We spent two weeks on those verses, and we talked about believers in Christ are to be people who practice kindness and faithfulness, dependability. Last week we were in verses 5 and 6, and we talked about trusting God instead of ourselves. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, means put him first, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Now, I ask you throughout this study that you please be praying for me because Proverbs is beating me up. Um, When I felt God leading me to this chapter, this book, I thought, you know, this is a pretty practical book. This will be easy. No, it is not easy. And it is whipping me. So I appreciate your continued prayers because I am working on verses 11 and 12. And what it talks about the Lord's discipline, that is not going to be an easy sermon to preach. And it has certainly not been an easy sermon to work on. And so uh, I please pray. Uh, it will be to your advantage if you pray for me. So that when you sit through that, it will it'll be meaningful to us and helpful to us. But today we're at verses 7 and 8. And the principle is develop the fear of the Lord. Now I realize that we have talked about the fear of the Lord already because Solomon mentions it regularly and with great frequency in the book of Proverbs. But he tells us in these two verses, verses 7 and 8, don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and shun evil. It will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. These verses naturally flow out of verses 5 and 6. In verses 5 and 6, he basically says, trust in the Lord, not yourself, and he'll direct you. And then he says it again, basically, don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord. You can always kind of count on Gene Peterson and his translation, or his paraphrase, the message to kind of bring things down to to earth. Here is his paraphrase of verses 5 through 8. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything. Everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God, run from evil. Your body will glow with health and your very bones will vibrate with life. That's a pretty interesting paraphrase there. And it seems to me when when, when I looked at these two verses, verses seven and eight, I saw our humility, I saw our duty, and I saw God's promise. Our humility, he says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Again, that's an echo from verse 5. Lean not into your own understanding. It's what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, where he says, don't be wise in your own conceits. In other words, don't think that you know more than God does. Now, our initial reaction to that is, of course I don't know more than God does. But when we stop and get real serious with how we live and how we think and how we rationalize things, There are times when we act as if we know more than God does. Well, he's way up in heaven, and he doesn't understand how those people are treating me, and he doesn't understand what they said, and he doesn't understand the the, the dilemma I'm in, and, and I'm just going to have to do something. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You don't know more than God does. You know, I don't have a better idea than he does. I sometimes have thought that I did. 
And, and he that sits in the heavens just laughs and says, well, go for it if you want to. Right? And how many of us have regretted those decisions? Matthew Henry wrote, there is not a greater enemy to the fear of God in our hearts than the conceitedness of our own wisdom. So Solomon says, lean not unto your own understanding. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Now, that does not mean don't use your brain. You know, uh, there's a lot of people who think that when you become a Christian, you put your brain in neutral or you stick it on a shelf somewhere. That's not what he's saying. You do you, your due diligence. You do your research. If you're a pros and cons list maker, you list your pros and cons. You go through, if you're thinking about buying a car, you check out, you know, all of the blue books and car faxes and everything. You check it out. You look for the reviews. You look at what Motor Trend says about it, and what Car and Driver says about it, and what Consumer Report says about it, and people that you know who've driven. You, you check it out. But before you ultimately make the decision, you pray and say, God, it seems to me that this is probably the best decision for me to make. Please guide me. And if it's not, stop it. You know, it's appropriate to do that. I've prayed that sometimes. You've probably prayed that sometimes. And you went back and the car was gone because somebody else had bought it. And my initial reaction is, <clears throat> and there's a, wait a minute, dummy. You just prayed that if that wasn't the one for you, God would stop it. So thank him that he knew something you didn't know. And stop trying to be wise in your own eyes. And trust him. So again, you do your due diligence. You do your research. You use your brain. But the ultimate decider is God. Saying, God, give me wisdom to know what to do. You'll hear me use terms like open doors and closed doors. You know, when you're praying about something and the door opens up and say, okay, this seems to be the way God's directing. And then another door opens up and say, okay, I need to go this way. And then a door closes. And we try to figure out why the door closed. We talked about that last week with Paul trying to get to, to Asia and never does get there because God wants him in Troas and how God uses the daily events of our lives to show us his will. That's what Solomon is saying. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Trust God. God, thank you that you know things I don't know. And I thought this was the job I wanted. But I didn't get it. So obviously you knew something about it that I don't. Thank you for watching over me. So that's our humility. God, you know better than I do. You know more than I do. And I trust your wisdom. But then our duty is fear the Lord and shun evil. Now we, again, talked a few weeks ago about the fear of the Lord. We're not talking about being afraid of God. We're talking about an attitude of respect, an attitude of reverence, an attitude of worship toward him. Job says the fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. To shun evil is understanding. And if you weren't here the week that we went into some detail about the fear of the Lord, I, this will be new to you if you were here. This will be a review to you. But because Solomon talks about the fear of the Lord so often and says that it's the beginning of wisdom, and he talks about wisdom so much, this is a key concept that we need to keep pounding into our brains and into our spirits. And I want to just briefly remind you of what David in the Psalms says about some of the benefits of the fear of the Lord. The one that always stops me is Psalm 25, verse 14. The Lord confides in those who fear Him. That is an incredible statement. The Lord confides in those who fear Him. To stop and think that God wants to share his wisdom with you. He wants to share insight with you. He wants to share direction with you. He confides in those who fear him. It's, it's like, you remember when God appeared to Abraham to talk to him about Sodom and Gomorrah? And God says, should I hide from Abraham what I'm getting ready to do? That's an incredible statement of the relationship that God wants to have with us. To confide in us. Psalm 31, 19. How abundant are the good things that you've stored up for those who fear you. 
Psalm 145, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry. He saves them. Psalm 147, the Lord delights in those who fear him. You just read those verses and you say, I want to develop the fear of the Lord because I want that kind of a relationship with him. Throughout the book of Proverbs, I'm going to flip through these. You can flip through them if you want to. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. I kind of got stuck on that. For their children it will be a refuge. Now I know he's talking primarily about you know, why your children are home with you, but there's something that happens when parents develop the fear of the Lord that they pass that on to their children and their children reap the benefits of living in a home where the fear of the Lord is developed and practiced. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Chapter 19, verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. And we sat there a few weeks ago and we talked about the fact that that does not mean that if you fear the Lord, there's never going to be trouble your way. But it means that there's going to be peace in the midst of that. And then chapter 22, verse 4. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. These are just some of the promises. I encourage you when we began this study, go through the book of Proverbs with you know, colored pencils if you've got a Bible that you mark up and, and mark understanding and wisdom and the fear of the Lord and some of these and just study them and the things that Solomon says. But the scripture also tells us how to develop it. I'm so glad the Bible is a practical book. It doesn't say, you should fear the Lord. Do your best to figure out how to do that. He says, you should fear the Lord, and here's what it means, and here's how you do it. And it begins with step number one, obey God's law. That's the bottom line of the fear of the Lord. It's obedience to God's law. And in the book of Deuteronomy, there are some verses that, that point this out. Chapter 5, verse 29. This, this is God, and he says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me, and keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. You see the connection? Fear me, keep my commands. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him or fearing him. Chapter 10, verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to serve Him with all your heart and all your soul, to observe His commands and decrees. The fear of the Lord is not some nebulous kind of thing. You sit in the corner and you know try to get in the cross-legged position and go, oh, the fear of the Lord. No, it's obeying God. It's the practical, down-to-earth, nitty-gritty, Obey what God called us to do. But the second element of the fear of the Lord, he tells us in our text, chapter 3, verse 7, hate evil. The NIV says shun. I think the King James says depart from. It's a word that means to violently turn against and to rebel against. Hate evil. Solomon says that over and over. Chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And throughout the book of Proverbs, he ties those things together. The fear of the Lord is, number one, obeying God's law. Number two, hating evil. I was mulling on this last night late, and, and I think this is where we have our biggest problem in, in our world today, in the church world today. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, be not conformed to this world. J.D. Phillips 
paraphrase of the New Testament says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And you know what it's like if you cook, and you have a mold and you put something in it and it takes the shape of the mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. As Christians, we are having a more and more difficult time not allowing the world to squeeze us into its mold. We have basically bought into the world's idea that if you hate sin, somehow you hate people. And that if you speak out against sin, somehow that means you're intolerant and hateful. No. There's a difference between being intolerant and disrespectful of people and saying this is what the Bible says about sin. And, and I think that this is where we tend to run into the, the biggest difficulty as believers trying to develop the fear of the Lord is maintaining a hatred of sin. Sin is not a good thing. You know? Sin is bad, right? What did you learn in church today? Sin is bad. Well, it is. You know, it sends people to hell. It sent Christ to the cross. You know, sin is not a laughing matter. And if we're not careful, we have lost that depart from evil. And, and it's a challenge for us. You know, one of the biggest challenges that we have is how to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world in a winsome, loving way to where people will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And depending on, you know, where you are in your life and, and the social circles you run in and all those things, each of us will face that challenge in a unique way. But the challenge is still there. Obey God, hate evil, fear the Lord, shun evil. And the third thing you do is you stay in the Word of God. And that goes back to the very beginning of chapter 3. Do not forget my teaching. Keep my commandments. If, repeatedly, God said through Moses, the fear of the Lord means obey me, then we need to stay in the Word so that we know to obey Him. Remember and obey the book of Deuteronomy is Moses talking to the children of Israel before they get ready to go into the promised land. And he says to them in chapter 31, once you get there, once you get to the new promised land, now remember that all of the adults basically have died off in the wilderness. So this is a new generation that's getting ready to go to the promised land. And he says, when you get there, assemble the people, men, women, and children, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully follow all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God. In other words, he's saying there's been a generation arise up here that doesn't know the things that the old generation knew. And you need to gather them together. And you remember there's a time when they did. They got them all together in those Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and they read the words of the law. In Deuteronomy 17, Moses said, when you have a king and you get to the new land, when he takes the throne of the kingdom, he is to write for himself a copy of the law. You know, they say you learn more when you actually write out what you're hearing. And he's saying the king, when he becomes king, he needs to sit down with this law and he needs to hand write himself a copy of it. And it is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to follow carefully all the words of this law. Fear the Lord, hate evil. Fear the Lord, hate evil. Obey God, hate evil. That's what it means to fear the Lord. Obey him, hate sin. And if you remember when Israel went way, way away from God, when they had the revival, it started when somebody was cleaning up the temple and found a copy of the law. And they started to read it, and the king said, oops, I believe we may be in trouble here <laughs> because we're not doing what the law says. And revival and reformation came. Our humility, don't be wise in your own eyes. Our duty, fear the Lord and shun evil. Obey him hate sin. His promise is verse 8. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. I have to read the King James Version to you. 
it says, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. If I were in a junior high chapel, I would just say navel over and over again and the kids would pay attention and I'd have them, right? It will be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Why in the world would Solomon say that? You remember I said first week of our study, we're going to be doing word studies. We're going to be looking at what these words mean. And again, remember, it's been a long time since I've talked to you about this. Remember, you don't need to know a lick of Hebrew in order to do this. Get a Strong's Concordance. You can find it online. You can download it at a free app most places. And Strong's Concordance has numbers. Now, I'm assuming you know numerical order. That's on you. But you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek. But you know the numbers. You will also find in Bible study apps, you will find resources like Hebrew dictionaries, Greek dictionaries, that are number coded to Strong's Concordance. So if you're reading along and there's a little number that says number 1018, well, you go to this resource and you look up number 1018 and it tells you this is what the word is and this is what the word means. And you can pretend to be a Hebrew scholar just as I do. But I, I did the study of this word and the word that will be helped to your navel, the reason the King James translated navel is because the Hebrew word means the umbilical cord. And I was like, oh! Now I have to be real careful. There's a physician among us. I have to be careful to be accurate in my stuff. Just smile and nod and pretend that I know what I'm talking about. So I started saying, why in the world would Solomon say that the fear of the Lord is going to be health to your navel, to your umbilical cord? So I started Googling and talking to my in-house resident, Donna, and I said, you know, talk to me about this. Well, you know that the placenta has all of the oxygen and the water and the nutrients that the baby needs to grow in the uterus, and that also produces this hormone that's necessary for a healthy pregnancy, and that the placenta is attached to the baby in the womb through the umbilical cord, which is the lifeline between the mother and the baby. That umbilical cord has a vein that carries oxygenated blood from the placenta to the baby, and it has two arteries that carry the waste back into the placenta for, for, to be uh, passed on. And during the end of the pregnancy, antibodies are passed from the placenta through the umbilical cord to the baby, those antibodies that will help protect the baby for at least the first three months after life. So, huh. So the umbilical cord is the lifeline. It's the thing that keeps the baby alive. It is the thing that connects mama and baby and keeps that baby vibrant. Solomon says, the fear of the Lord is your spiritual umbilical cord. It is the fear of the Lord, obeying God and hating evil, that keeps you connected to God. And it is that that keeps those nutrients flowing to you. It is that that keeps those antibodies flowing through you. You don't get that from reading the paper or watching the news or listening to society. You get that by developing the fear of the Lord, obeying God and hating sin. And then I kept studying, and, and these are areas of, of research, and they're still controversial in some circles, but there's some interesting things going on with the idea of getting the blood after birth, getting the blood from the umbilical cord and storing it because that blood has the baby stem cells in it. The stem cells that basically can go into whatever cell needs to be done and it's a hundred percent matched to that baby so that if that baby is born with a weakness or if later it develops an anti-immune issue or other kinds of issues, if that blood is in storage they can transfuse that blood into what now is that child and maybe can get healing from some of those issues from that cord blood. And, and I thought about that, you know, even after, and they're, they're saying that even that that cord blood could be helpful in, in dealing with illnesses that that baby's siblings would develop later because of the DNA similarities. And then I remember that we read a couple of verses in here where, where Solomon said, the fear of the Lord will not only watch over you, it will watch over your children. And I, huh. 
And then I did some more stuff and talked to Donna a little bit, and she talked about there's now people talking about the importance of delaying the clamping off of the umbilical cord after the birth of a child, that it shouldn't be done right away. It should last maybe three minutes, and so, you know, the National Institutes of Health are giving different um, suggestions on how long it should be, especially in preterm babies. Because what they're finding is the longer that that baby is connected to the umbilical cord, they have better circulation, they have better red blood cell volume, they need fewer blood transfusions, they have less of a problem with iron deficiency, and there's nearly a 50% reduction in intraventricular hemorrhage as they stay connected to the umbilical cord. Like, huh. Thousands of years before any of this, God said to Solomon, you know something? Tell those people that the fear of the Lord is like their umbilical cord. And what the umbilical cord is to their physical health and well-being, the fear of the Lord is to their spiritual health and well-being. Now, you, you, you just take that and you start developing it and you Google some stuff and you get a Bible study together and you say, I need to develop the fear of the Lord. I need to be healthy, I need to be strong, I need to have spiritual antibodies, I need to develop the fear of the Lord. And so, hundreds of years ago, Adam Clark, in his commentary, wrote, in effect, Solomon says, that the fear of the Lord is as essential to the life of God in the soul of man, and to the continual growth in grace, as the umbilical cord is to the life and the growth of the baby in the womb. Without the latter, the umbilical cord, no human being could ever exist. Without the former, the fear of the Lord, no true religion can ever be found. It will be health to your neighbor. Fear, obey him, hate sin, stay in the word. You didn't need to come to church to hear that. You know that. <laughs> but we need to be reminded, don't we? Obey God, hate sin, stay in the word and it will be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Now, I spent so much time on the first part, I didn't go into all the marrow stuff, but you're aware that the marrow of the bone is the life of the bone, and if your marrow starts being attacked, your bones start to weaken, and therefore your body starts to weaken, and you collapse, you know, literally. And so what marrow is, or marrow is, to the support and strength of the bones, and healthy bones are to the strength and support of the body, the fear of the Lord is to the strength and support of the soul. So what he's saying is, is the fear of the Lord, that, that, and that's why we're going to probably, I'm sure, preach two, three, or four more times through the book of Proverbs on this, because we're only at chapter 3 and we got a lot more to go. The fear of the Lord is what gives us our health spiritually. It's what gives us our strength spiritually. Somebody put it this way, it is nourishing, it will be health to your navel, and strengthening marrow to your bones. No wonder he said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is where it starts. Obey God, stay away from sin, and stay in the word to remind you to obey God and stay away from sin. And it will give you nourishment, it will give you strengthening, it will help you stay strong in the times of testing and trials and temptation. It will give you strength for the battles that we face in this life. The fear of the Lord, staying connected to God. So I need you to picture somehow, however it works for you, you know, the Bible and an umbilical cord stretching to you. Because that's what he's saying. Stay in the Word, which will remind you to obey God and hate sin, and that will keep you connected to Him, and that will give you the strength and the nourishment you need. I tried to come up with some kind of a clever way to end this time, but I realized I could not improve on what Solomon says, starting in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, He'll direct your paths. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Shun evil. It will bring health to your body, nourishment to your bones. Father, help us stay connected to you. 
there, there's so much in, in our world that would cause us to lose that connection. Help us to stay connected. Just like when we go into a new place and we're looking for a Wi-Fi signal, Lord, help us stay connected to you so that you can download your spirit and your insight and your information and your wisdom to us and we can receive it clearly and then act on it so that we can have the nourishing and strengthening that we need to live for you at this time in our world. May we be people that demonstrate in our lives the fear of the Lord. To not only in our own lives find peace with you, but to be able to help others to find peace with you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you.